which we call conditional cash transfer to women to send their children to school, particularly girl children. Why do you think we have to pay a stipend? I mean, the very fact that you're beginning to see models, for instance, like, I mean, icons like Amina Mohammed, yes. you don't think it's inspirational enough? You have to, because in our tradition, women believe to be sorry to stay at home, doing the domestic work, rearing cattle, working, and so on and so on, to charge or recharge the local economy of the family. So if you are giving out something, this shows what that particular lady or girl supposed to bring to the family is not uh, no, is no more relevant since you will be collecting something at the end of every month or at the end of every week so that that particular child who is a girl should go to school another thing if we are cattle we are doing cattle rearing we allow women or girls to take charge of the cattle rearing so if you will be give them you will be giving them some stipend this category in this time around will not longer will not be done by 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 girls uh, again you will hire somebody to do it somebody that is professional mm -hmm. maybe you can take it to bush to somebody who is going to rear it for some times before it becomes matured for commercial uh, reason okay. uh, uh, i'm afraid we have to go back to the audience <laughs> uh any more questions from i would like a question this time around please mm -hmm. you have a question madam yes please My name is Lois Outer, the founder of Cedar Seed Foundation, where we advocate for the rights of disabled persons, particularly women. Women with disabilities suffer triple jeopardy. First, as a woman. Secondly, as a woman with disability. And lastly, from the society. We have barriers that stop us from performing excellently. For instance, when I was coming, I had to be carried. We need access in all the infrastructures. So my question is to my honorable member, what are you doing to ensure that women with disabilities are carried along? Um, we have passed the Persons Living with Disabilities Bill. And part of that is that, um, as you said, public buildings and all buildings must have access to people living with disability. We also believe, and part of what it is that we say, and of course Section 42 of the Constitution is also there that speaks to discrimination. And we also have decided that, and we make the point as well, not only for people living with disabilities, but also for women, that the Constitution is self-evident, but it's not self-enacting. And so we need um, pieces of legislation that help the Constitution along to cater to the people who um, have special needs, are differently abled, and so on and so forth. Now, that bill has been passed. It has been signed into law. Now, that is what I can do as a legislator, pass the bill, and I'm very happy to say that it is one of the bills that was actually passed in the last assembly. Now, implementation is yet another kettle of fish. But then, of course, in our oversight, in our oversight, we oversight laws, appropriations, and policies. And with laws and policies, what it is that we do is test the piece of legislation and find out ways in which it has been effective or ineffectual and then come up with amendments that seek to correct any mischiefs that may arise from the implementation of same. Now, I can tell you that there is committees, the Committee on Women Affairs in the House has the oversight functions of that. Let me say that implementation will, is the challenge. It's not for want of passing the bill and I'm sure that as we go along, because the bill is actively six months old, at least about two years old, I think. It was passed in the last house. It wasn't signed into law. It wasn't signed into law. We, well, we sent it to the executive arm of government. So maybe the question should go to the executive arm of government and why they haven't appended their signature to it. But as far as the legislative work on that bill is concerned, it has been completed. Now, what I can do 
what I will do is I'll go back and find out. Because what happens is that after a bill has not been signed into law, it has to start de novo. But what we've decided is that since it has gone through the legislative processes, we don't need to go through that process again. And then we'll just go through the process of finding out whether I indeed what at what stage it is with the executive arm of government. But I can say to you that as far as the legislature is concerned, we have finished the legislative work. And I'm sure you were at the public hearing when that bill was. Thank you so much, Honourable. At this point, we'll have to go to Lagos, uh, where Amara is standing by, looking really bold in that blue jacket. Amara, it's back to you now in the audience in Lagos. Thanks a lot, Mark. Well, you're equally looking bold in your red. What a color to wear on this day. Uh, well, back here in Lagos, I have the Deputy High Commissioner to, of the British Deputy High Commissioner, uh, Laura Bofis, whom I've been speaking with uh, the past few days, and she's been talking to me about how passionate she has been about women's issues. It's another International Women's Day, and the theme this year is Be Bold for Change. We've talked about this before. Is it frustrating that we're still talking about the same issues year after year? First of all, thank you for having me here. Um, it is frustrating, but at the same time, we should recognize that progress has been made. So we are not at the same place that we were a year ago, several years ago. Progress has been made on many different fronts. Uh, we've just heard legislative change, but also in terms of education, getting girls into school, in terms of access to family planning, in many different fronts, we have seen progress. That said, we are here today because so much more needs to be done and also because we can't afford to be complacent about what changes have been made and what progress has been made. If we, if we forget to focus on these things, if we take our eye off the ball, we can, we can also see reversals. So it's important to maintain the, the, the positive trajectory of change. And we also have in the, uh, well, she's also on the panel, even though she's seated uh, amongst the audience, uh, famous actress, so Motola Ekende Jaladi. Thank you for joining us. Um, People think you have it all together. I mean, we've watched you grow, you know, in your profession. A lot of women look up to you, especially young girls look up to you, and they take their cue from you. But you must have had some challenges, right, getting up until this point. What can we, what's, what's, what, what else can we learn from you, you know, through your challenges and what you've done? How else are you encouraging women to also step up to the plate rather than being complacent and waiting to be handed, you know, their, their dues? Thank you very much for having me here. Um, the challenges I would say I could have had would have been education, because as you probably know, and a lot of people know, I got married at the age of 18. And um, I think it's very important to say here that you can't get married early and still pursue your education, because um, that seems to be a very sore spot. You know, like people think it can work hand in hand, like um, once you get married, you can go to school or stuff. Um, I'm not here to preach what um, and when to get married. Um, I think the acceptable age should be 18 upwards. Um, but I'm saying that you can actually still pursue your education even after you get married. And like um, one of the ladies already said, and Mr. Asika, you don't have to wait till things are handed over to you. Uh, that's the problem a lot of women have. Um, I, in, the, in the industry that I started from, um, Nollywood started from almost nothing when I joined, and we were starting on the same, you know, almost the same playing field with men and women. 